Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 43 of the Evolve Achieve Thrive podcast with a slightly different looking co-host today. It's not quite Umar, <laughs> the Umar that we know. So uh, <laughs> if you haven't heard what's happened already, I would recommend you listening to the announcement in the podcast feed or if you're tuning on in YouTube, there's an announcement prior to the release of this episode. Uh, but um, long story short, Umar won't be doing the podcast for the foreseeable future. And instead, I'm joined by the special guest of episode 11, Jude Hersheimer, aka today, Juju Tello. So Judy thank Tello. you for joining. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. thank you for joining me, Jude. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for co-hosting with me. How's it going? Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a really good thing. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah it's awesome. And uh, yeah, is, we're, we're pleased to have you as well. So cool. you've got your own, you've got your own funky name as well. We always start off like, trying to yeah. like, yeah. explain, exp explaining what's going on with our names. And yeah. uh, you are Gigi Tello. What's going on there? I am, well, I am Gigi Tello because uh, a little while ago, as uh, our conversations tend to go, we had a, a, a super serious conversation about what a uh, Teenage <laughs> Mutant Ninja Turtle we would be. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and I can't remember why we were talking about Ninja Turtles, but, uh, but we were. And um, yeah. so, and I was like, well, I'd be Donatello, obviously, because he's scientific obviously. and all this, clearly, as a Ninja Turtle. And, uh, and so then it came about that I was Gigi Tello and Granado. Yeah. <laughs> obviously. That should, that should be a simple lead on, right? It's like, yeah. so it's like, it's Donatello, but Jude, Juju Tello, of course. You know, he's like, combine, combine the two and you got, that's who you got. And Granado was... Yeah. Uh, Leonardo, right? So Leonardo, Leonardo the other title, the, the one who's serious, spiritual, knowledgeable, the embodies, embodies the uh, the values of the turtles the most. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's me. That's me. I'm that guy. <laughs> but why were we talking about it? Why were we talking about turtles? I don't remember. It's like, why, why did our conversation branch out to Ninja Turtles? I don't know, but there's nothing wrong with that because Teenage Mutant Ninja nothing Turtles wrong with that. legendary. Legendary. They are legendary. Because and I actually, yeah, go on, carry on. I did, uh, because of that chat, I was inspired to watch the original movie again, the 1990 <laughs> one. And it is a sick film. It's so good. From like, uh, well, I have the nostalgia attached to it as well. Oh, like, yeah, I remember yeah, yeah. it like I'm a kid. It's just good and it's hilarious as well. And uh, do you remember it? Yeah, I do remember it. I actually remember, mm. I think there was a TV series as well. And I, mm -hmm. I'm this is how cool I am. I actually bought the seven inch single of the track Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Your seven inch single. Oh my God. I know. It's <laughs> like, what kind of history making like is that? <laughs> I actually think I still have it. If I can find it, I'll bring it. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, yeah, I used to collect vinyl and I actually yeah. have quite a big collection of vinyl because I used to DJ. And mm. I, I, had, <laughs> I had so many seven inches, and one of them was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's amazing. I, you know, it's amazing that you mentioned vinyl because I was back at my parents last week, and um, my dad had a, uh, an Indian singer's uh, vinyl sitting out, outside. I hadn't amazing. seen a vinyl in years. Like, yeah. I hadn't heard one. I hadn't seen one in years. Yeah. Like, in my, like with my own two eyes, like sitting in front of me. I was like, whoa. This is, kind of amazing. This, is, this is old school. So does your dad have a deck? Does he have uh, a record player? Sorry, I say decks, but a record player. Does he have that? Yeah, oh, is that I, what you mean? No, no, the actual, he had yeah, uh, vinyl. the vinyl. Yeah, the actual vinyl. But I like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if, if they still have one because I just saw it lying around. I thought, I don't know if they've been listening to it or what, but I was like, this is cool. This is good yeah, vinyl. I have a ton of vinyl. And actually, I think I showed them to you. I text, I sent you a picture, but I've got, all the Michael Jackson vinyl as well. Like yes. literally, I know. I have yes. like off the wall bad, like all his early stuff from the Jackson 5 as well. I've literally got yes. like probably hundreds of pounds worth of vinyl just, just sitting around at my mum and dad's or here. Like really, really rare stuff. And I, I love vinyl. Yeah. So and I have to get next. So um, it's, yeah, it's just fun to sometimes get it out and, and listen to it it's like a different kind of quality as well so yes i have the teenage yeah. mutant ninja turtle seven inch amongst many other sad weird and wonderful uh, bits of vinyl 
Yeah, that's legendary. It's like, what is, what's the deal, what's the deal with the quality difference then? So what's actually, what do you notice with vinyl? What's, what's, what's that? It's, it's, it's kind of, well, to me anyway, it's, it's grainier and it's more real. Like you can hear the pops, the crackles. It's not this clear, crisp. Mm. A lot of the recordings that I would listen to would be done not on the like latest Pro Tools or whatever it is that is this, you know, at the moment that, that people use. And, and it's just, it's a bit rawer. Uh, you know, the sound is, is um, it's not as refined. And I quite like that. And when you try and mix stuff right. together uh, using decks, it's, I've never really used any kind of, elect, you know, computer to computer or whatever, but it, it's just more real, it's more raw. You know, it's like, mm. I don't know if in this day and age that DJs do that anymore, but it, mm. it's a special kind of thing. It's actually, a, it's like a real technique to be able to mix, beat mix as well. So it's, um, mm. it's quite hard to do. And I think that's right. lost a little bit in this, in, this, um, in this time where everything's just kind of done on computer and people blend it in on a playlist, um, even DJs. So yeah, I don't know how we got mm. here, but yes, there we go. <laughs> That's just that's just your history, and we're going to explore that. So, I know. Like yeah. in, in chunks of it, but uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Because yeah, I was wondering about. Then that made me think of uh, yeah, my, like my brother said the same thing about movies, right? It was just like mm. there was a time when it was harder to make them. So even though they weren't perfect, even though they're not HD, 4K, whatever you're going to get now. Yep. Um, there's there's something. There's something about the like older older movie, the old like things done on film and back in the day, which just gives it that a bit more character than what you get nowadays. Yeah. And uh, so it sounds like you know you're saying the same sort of thing with uh, with vinyl Absolutely. versus I don't know. A bit more magical, movie. you know. Yeah. There's a lot more love and not a lot more love. That's not fair. But it's like the thought process and and the graph that goes into not only creating vinyl, obviously I used to work in the record industry, we used to like knock out loads of vinyl to push out to people because people love, like the collectors love old school vinyl or even like if it's right. a recent release, they still love that vinyl edition. Vinyl's phenomenally expensive. It's like 20 quid for uh, a 12 inch or whatever, but it is that magical kind of, there's nothing quite like it where you get a bit of vinyl and it's in its cover and the designs and everything are always different. But when you do vinyl cover design, you know, everything's just slightly different. And I think it mm. is that specialness of having a product that is physical as well. And that's the thing right. with on Technics is that it's very physical and you have to actually have a bit of rhythm as well and right. a bit of technical ability to be able to beat match because otherwise it just sounds like pots and pans. And, and, and that's not the same as when you, <laughs> when you do stuff on a computer, it's very easy to blend it all in and just set it mm. off and off you go. I don't know if that's unfair. Sorry, producers, if anyone's are listening, but <laughs> yeah, it's definitely got a bit more magic to it it's yeah it's just nostalgic as well i think and people i think people like hop back to that simpler time of when there was vinyl and it was all a little bit easier you know mm. yeah okay interesting yeah and all right well tell us jude why why are you here how comes you are my my, my, my co-host <laughs> what uh what do you what do you tell us about your background remind us about your background for anybody who hasn't listened to you sure. when uh we did episode 11 and uh why yeah, yeah why you're co-hosting with me so yeah I'm, I'm i'm not a musician i am a movement hmm. teacher and i'm a movement teacher that specializes in pilates and corrective exercise and functional movement which we're going to talk about a little bit later and i guess my speciality is treating lower back pain conditions and rehabbing, rehabbing uh, lower back pain conditions uh, far and wide, anything and everything. And um, I think that's probably something that we'll talk about a little bit later. But I also do a lot of postnatal um, conditions as well. And yeah, I guess I'm here because we, we do a lot of movement together as well. And, mm. you know, constantly trying to move better ourselves and figure out movement within our own bodies and push ourselves to create better movement as well. So mm. yeah, I guess that's why I'm here is it's all about the movement. Beautiful. I love that. All about the movement. And then, cause there's a couple of things that we wanted to talk about, which we thought would be useful yeah. for our listeners to hear, um, given Absolutely. your kind of experience. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, you know, how that overlaps with my experience as well. 
and you mentioned functional movement so and you're writing a little piece about that as well so yeah tell us because i'm i'm like i reckon a lot of people have heard of the phrase functional movement but not really understanding what it means yeah so where are you where are you coming at it uh, from so it's just it was something that you know I've, I've got it on my bio on instagram i've got it with my website and i'm like functional movement functional movement and i, I got thinking the other day it's like what does functional movement mean? What what am I talking about when I talk about functional movement? Like to the general public, to people that are looking at anyone's biography, anyone's website, it's like, what on earth does, does this term mean? And so it got me thinking about what does it mean? What what am I on about when I when I team the word functional movement, functional breathing? It's like, okay, so it's not dysfunctional, which means that maybe something's off kilter and it's not working well. So functional would kind of be moving along towards everyday movement for me. It's like, it is the movement that we do in every day, but it's also optimizing those biomechanics, those movements, multi-planar movements, which mean movements in all directions. They're not just forward and back, side to side, bending, twisting. It's, it's movements that we do in every day. And some people who uh, do functional movement courses have, um, kind of defined it as things like bending, twisting, um, lunging, squatting, walking. Um, and within that, that, I think that encompasses quite a huge range of movement exercises, things that we do as trainers. But it's true. It's like when you think about what we do on a daily basis, the first thing we do is bend and twist to get out of bed. So it has to have functionality within it. It's like a lot of people that I teach find getting out of bed the hardest thing to do in their day. It's like when it's the most painful. So it's like, let's bring a bit of that functionality back and create better functional movement. Um, so that's where I'm at. It's like, I wanted to get your thoughts. And what's really nice about doing this podcast is that I think of things and then I'm like, this is a really great way of exploring with someone else like what does it mean to say functional movement or functional breathing what does that mean but it is yeah. it's essentially getting people to breathe well and breathe from the right place so that when they breathe twenty five thousand times a day they're breathing better and that creates better stability within the whole of their body so mm -hmm. over to you kind of what it, what does it mean to you and and how do you see it yeah so there's, there's a, I feel like there's a baseline of movement that needs to uh, be, uh, be met, and the person needs to be able to exhibit, and, and I think functional movement is going to mean different things depending on who you are. There's, uh, but, yeah. I, but when I say there's a baseline needs to be met, because ultimately, first and foremost, we're all human beings, so we have started to decode what good movement for a human being is, and essentially that's minimizing asymmetries so if you like you know stronger on one side for example on one side of your body versus the other how much of an asymmetry is there between the two and can we uh, minimize that so that you know you're moving uh, you are as symmetrical as possible in that strength mm -hmm. and um, strength or movement or functional mobility or um, stability and we'll come on to what those mean and then mm -hmm. And by the same token is uh, getting rid of those imbalances that you might experience in your body. So if a good way to, a simple way to think about it is, you know, standing on one leg. Can you stand on one leg upright and maintain that posture? It's like, yeah, okay, cool. Then you try and stand on the other leg and it's like, oh, well, I'm a little bit all over the place. So there's an imbalance. Yeah. There. There's an asymmetry. There's an imbalance. And, um, and that's showing that something isn't like, you know, functioning the way it needs to be for you as a human being, given yeah. what you said about, say, walking. Walking is a, um, essentially a movement that a human being is designed to do. It's in our, it's actually encoded in us to eventually walk um, bipedally yeah. so that, you know, babies do it where they um, basically can't yeah. do anything for a bit, then they start to crawl yeah. around. And from that, they start to learn how to stand up and et cetera, et cetera, until they get to be able to walking. So that's not like, yeah. um, yeah, every, every child's going to do that if there's nothing wrong with the nervous system. So it's essentially an expression of you as a human being. And can you do that well? So can you do that without uh, that much asymmetry? It's probably going to be a, a, a little bit of asymmetry because the body itself isn't entirely symmetrical. In yeah. the sense that, you know, you've got organs sitting in one part of your body, which aren't there in another part yeah. of your body. Um, so there's that aspect of it. And then... Um, 
yeah, so then imbalances and stuff. So can you can you move well as a human being in the kinds of things that you mentioned? Lunges, bending, twisting, um, overhead stuff, like, you know, reaching yes. in front of you, pushing something. Sorry, push-pull as well. I forgot. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, no, big yeah. one, push-pull. Can you do these movements without putting undue stress on your on your joints? And, and that undue stress is essentially when the joint isn't being held in place in the in – in the correct manner where all muscles are balanced in its activity yeah. to keep the joint in in motion throughout its range of motion in the right place throughout its range of motion so that is what i would say is like baseline functional movement and then there's a layer on top yeah. of that which is okay well if you're an athlete specifically then what is your what is your sport if your sport is you know hockey just random one that came to my head as well it could be a million different things yeah you're going to spend a lot of yeah. time you know hunched hunched over and skating and if i saw you i'm thinking of for some reason i don't know why it's like not even a sport that we barely play in this country we just came to my mind but it's like you know you just do an ice hockey like bent over you're skating around it's like okay you're going to spend a lot of yeah. time in that position so you've got to get pretty good at being in that position so that's functional for you um gymnasts for example some of them a lot of them will spend time on their hands um inverted so being functional for you is spending a lot of time on your hands and getting comfortable being there and mm. basically making sure that your joints align themselves so that they're not getting undue stress from finding yourself into that position so there's that aspect and for everyday people it can be being a you know you're a desk athlete you know if you're if you're working at an office job you know right. everybody's working a lot online right now right massive so you're sitting in front of sitting in front of a desk and they like, okay well how do i do that as well as i possibly can without screwing myself up because that can screw you up pretty badly like if you're doing mm. one thing too much too much of it and too often and um so there's there's the layers that get added on top of that so what is functional for you and then you know there's that essentially you know we're talking about minimizing asymmetries minimizing imbalances um and maximizing efficiency so how your joints uh, align themselves throughout a full range of motion of the activity that you do. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's coordination. That requires coordination of the muscles to fire up in a certain way so that your joint is being held in the right place during the movement. Yeah. And because if, if you're getting too much pull from one muscle and not enough from another, then it's going to pull the joint out into uh, uh, part, of the, part of the joint, um, pull the bone out into part of the joint where it's not um max uh, like optimally contacting the the, the, the surfaces of the joint are, yeah exactly they're not yeah. optimally contacted and the term for that is centration there isn't actual yeah, proper centration nice. going on so there's that and then yeah and then you're going to incorporate the brain with that as well because essentially the central nervous system is governing your movement and there's mm -hmm. that communication between brain and body so the brain has to be able to interpret the messages that it's getting from the body uh, not uh, in an un, like in an unscrambled kind of way it's like not misinterpret it's not that it's not mis it's misinterpreting it's actually doing what it does based on the messages that the body is giving it but we want to yeah. make sure those messages that the body gives it are accurate so Optimum. that the brain can say yeah. go and do this movement without screwing yourself up so yeah. reach um, for, for something me, reach well pull yeah. something push something well that kind of thing yeah yeah exactly like do it so that everything lines up nicely and everything does it well yeah. so that's essentially what functional movement is can you function well as a human being first and foremost nice. and then on top of that it's like okay what does what does your sport require what does your day-to-day -day life require you know people who have mm -hmm. kids you're going to, you know, especially if they're young and you're holding them by your side mm -hmm. and like, you know, a lot of people end up doing the, the whole hip, yep. hip hike and holding the baby yep. up over here. It's like, okay, Massive. well, you need to combat that and you need to learn how to actually hold your baby so that you are not screwing yourself up and not giving yourself hip issues or shoulder issues or anything yep. like that and, um, and learning how to function well in that regard. Absolutely. And I think something interesting that you said as well, it's like people in their sport or people who are <laughs> deaf after deaf athletes as well it's like we also need to counteract what they're doing as well if you're a hockey player and you're constantly in a certain position like I've taught a couple of pro golfers and they're very rotated over to one side so it's almost like like you say with the mm -hmm. symmetrical side of it you have to almost counterbalance and counteract what they're doing they do like repetition after repetition any mm -hmm. athlete any sportsman anyone working at a desk that's 
they they spend a lot of hours a day in one position so i think our job as coaches and trainers and teachers is to almost counteract that movement as well and get them strong in other positions so again we go back to that symmetry but then also we go back to i i I don't know and see what you think but i know we're trying to get people back to as balanced and as symmetrical place as possible but i don't know if we're ever going to achieve true symmetry i mean even if you look at the diaphragm the diaphragm it's got little legs at the back and if you connect one of them connects onto l2 lumbar spine two one of them connects onto l3 so already we have like a a kind of asymmetrical movement through there but at the same time we are trying to generate stability and, and centration through our center as well so i think it's about finding healthy balance as well and getting people if they are in one position for a really long time to counterbalance that with with the other side you know it's like that whole idea if you've got a stretch a muscle to contract it if we're constantly sitting down where our spinal muscles are constantly on stretch and we're not taking them into contraction so that's when back issues can occur and so i always see it as my job is to just optimize the body and bring it back into that functionality yeah i understand and for anybody who's not fully aware what's the diaphragm so the diaphragm is a muscle that sits pretty much in between the thorax so this area here in the abdomen and it sits from front to back and it's like this kind of parachute looking muscle that is basically the main muscle involved in breathing it's like the main deal the main guy and its job is pretty much to as we breathe in push down and create within the abdominal area like a pressurized container that creates what we call intra-abdominal pressure and as we breathe out it comes back up so it's this main muscle in breathing that and also I'm, I'm, I'm going to probably get this this quote wrong but Dr Andrew Huberman says it's the only muscle within the body that can have is it a direct effect on the brain and how we control our brain is that is that the the right way of saying it i can't really remember yeah yeah pretty um, much it's just yeah it's essentially the only muscle that has an effect on um direct effect on our organs and um that organ yeah. being the brain yeah um, given that the brain is like governs our movement governs how we perceive the world all that yeah, kind of stuff absolutely. that's that's huge and that's not it's, it's like it's kind of yeah it's not it's not it's not a mistake of human it's not a mistake of nature for that mm. to be the case there's there's a reason um, why that's the case yeah yeah which um we could, which we could delve into or leave people well, hanging about. <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah. uh yeah you go first because I'm, I'm still trying to kind of collate my thoughts on it but yeah carry on hmm. go <laughs> yeah there's um yeah there's um and when Judah was referencing l2 l3 is just a vertebrae in the lumbar spine in the lower back so they stretch down the the attachments of the muscle stretch down to those areas and uh, which is the point that you was making is you know there's an asymmetry naturally there in terms of how the muscle is organized in the body so mm -hmm. could we actually tr achieve true symmetry it's like no so you don't have to worry no. about you know something like okay you might have been working on an asymmetry. We just don't want it to be a big asymmetry. You want to minimize it as much as possible. Yeah. You might have been working on an asymmetry yeah. and you're like, oh, there's just this little bit left and I can't quite get it. Okay, don't worry about it. It's like, uh, there's, there's bigger fish to fry than that. There'll be other things to to worry about. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Absolutely. You know, just spitballing as well. Cause like maybe if you're ambidextrous, both left foot, right foot, left hand, right hand, you're using both. Oh, equally. you a little bit of that. I'm yeah, a little bit of um, that. You are, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, exactly. Just like, yeah, just in strange ways, though. It's kind of like I'll, I'll play racket sports with my left hand, but I'll throw with my right hand. <laughs> and, okay. uh, but you're left handed, like, aren't you? Yeah, and I write with my left hand. So, right. but if I try and write with my right hand, then it's like you, you're looking at a three year old trying to learn how to write for the first time. So it's just, uh, <laughs> it's just a bit strange. Actually, and, but I get used to it quicker. So I'll, like, I'll be writing my name out and then eventually it gets better and better and better as the lines. Wow. Down. Yeah, of, of I course. That's quite hard that, to but... do. Yeah, of course <laughs> yeah. you have. And actually that's probably a really, really important thing to do because the brain works in cross patterning. Mm -hmm. Like what happens within the yes. right, right side of the brain controls the left side of our body and vice versa. Um, there's literally within mm -hmm. the cells, within, within certain aspects of the brain, 
there's there's right side areas and left side so it is it, it, it's key to be able to do that and the fact that you can actually write left and right i don't think i've tried to write my right hand i'm left-handed too for a really long time yeah. but i it will be a disaster but i'm sure it'll get better but also with left hand and right hand i don't know if you but i'm a proper left-handed writer i write upside down oh you do so, that <laughs> yeah i do so i've always smudged my work and so with the right side yeah. i find it i'm like oh i can't you're cramped write. up <laughs> yeah how how do you do this so it's like anatomically it's really different to write with your right hand whereas i'm like oh you like that with my left so do you not write like that with your left you write properly yeah, actually, I just, yeah, I do that. I just, I just basically drag my hand across the page. I push it across the page. Whereas if you're right-handed, you're like pulling it across the page, right? But All it's right, like, no, I'm just it pushing it across the page. Yeah. Uh, or I should, is it, Jap is it Japanese? It's like, yeah, I think they write like right to left. I should just figure out how to do that instead. <laughs> or left, yeah. So that I could just drag it across the page. Yeah, or maybe. So hard, maybe though. I should have. Yeah. But it's uh, yeah, but it's interesting. It's like yeah, that's essentially it. It's like that's one of the things. If yeah, um, it's important if you're actually introducing a challenge to yourself, which is new. It could be something as simple as that. But because it fires up yeah. uh, these kinds of brain regions, and uh, well, what it does is introduce a challenge, which is like you know, kind of at the edge of your capacity. You have to focus mm -hmm. on that, and then when you're focused on it, and it's a challenge at the edge of your capacity, and um, you, you start to enter that bit of a zone where you hit a bit of a flow. It's like, okay, this is this is new. Yeah. Let me. So it's novel. It's challenging, and you have to focus. And that is. And those are some of the conditions that are required for changing the brain, which is mm -hmm. um, you know the the principle of neuroplasticity. So if you're able to do that, and uh, then you know, even if that's not the skill that you're trying to get better at. If you do that and then, you know, you kind of hit that flow a little bit, but then you move and then you go and take that into something that you are mm. trying to get better at. So you just move from that task and then go into something else. Then that kind of gateway that you've opened up for changing your brain is a little bit easier to do apply. on the next task. Yeah, Pretty so nice. you can apply onto the next task. So that's a way yeah. of doing it because, um, yeah, it's like uh, you, yeah, it's, it's using your body in that challenge and then, changing yeah. it to uh, the task that you actually want to get good at so that you, you, you open up the gateway and now you can try and yeah. uh, maximize that in the next task what i also find useful especially when it's it's difficult and there's strain where you're trying to learn something new is to and i and i, I sort of trust myself with this say you're trying to learn a new movement or i'm trying to i don't know edit a photo and and i'm trying to figure out something new and it's not quite working i think What's also useful is like, you know, feeling that strain, that agitation for sure, but then also putting it away, sleeping on it, and which mm. helps the connectivity and the, the, the neuroplasticity to, to almost kick in a little bit more. And then you come back to it and it's almost like over time, and I see this with my clients all the time. At first they're like, I have no idea what movement, I can't get that into my brain. And then I'm like, just give it time. Next week, you're gonna nail it. And I'm 100%, always that it always happens so it's almost yeah. like that giving yourself that time that that momentary time to sleep on it as well really yeah. helps to to almost cement what you're trying to achieve and, and it always like, like with women maybe a little bit different like i'm trying to do that squat that you're you've nailed at the moment and i haven't quite got oh. it but it's nearly there and uh the dragonfly squat yeah, is that what it is? You have to kind of curt, kind of curtsy yeah. lunge and then go into the squat. And um, it's not there yet, but I think it just is going to take my brain and my muscles and everything a little bit of time to get the strength and the mobility to, to get all the way down and back up. But I know yeah. I'll do it. I know. I know. And, yeah. you know, it's the same with, with editing. It's like I think we were talking about maybe video editing or something the other day and it's just like ugh, it's really hard and the setup's hard but then once you understand what you're doing and and you've given yourself a few days with it it um mm. it just it becomes second nature and it's just very yeah. easy to kind of just flip it all in and put it all in and then and then it's done so mm -hmm. you need that strain to be able to get there you need that time away to get to there as well i think yeah absolutely and um, you know that's a great example. Like using that dragonfly squat as an example, mm. is um, for me is like there's 
there's a video of me on Instagram doing it where I'm holding that tail leg basically so with yes. the dragonfly squat is essentially you're going down on one leg but your yep. other leg comes behind you and then the foot starts to point forward though so it sounds ridiculous but oh. go on my Instagram page and you'll see the video of me doing it right and it's um i'm holding my leg because at that time when i did it i couldn't do it without holding my leg up that yeah. tail leg and with my hand and because if i tried like my whole inner thigh my inside my, yeah. my, my lower shin just cramped like crazy my body right. was like what the hell are you doing you can't <laughs> yeah. do this right now and uh, it would just cramp up and it's like okay i'm stuck here <laughs> i just yeah. I can't actually oh move. i just topple and, uh, yeah yeah that's it. And uh, yeah, just topple over. But now, like, um, there'll be a new video of it on on my feed. And it's me doing it on both sides without using right. my hand, right? Because, uh -huh. um, first of all, like, I had more issues stabilizing and being and uh, with my mobility on my right side because of like i've had several fractures on the <laughs> right side of my body basically on my right shin oh wow uh, on my okay right, on my right ankle my and my foot so it's like basically a dislocated toe a fractured metatarsal and then a fractured um you know, fractured that make excuses so, Gorinda. yeah he's like look i'm showing you <laughs> that there so are no me. excuses <laughs> it's like, i've got like, a broken toe and a, yeah. <laughs> no yeah exactly no, all of it <laughs> doesn't matter it's like uh yeah i don't have a leg but i could still do it there's uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's no excuses no excuse so exactly what with uh so on the right side i couldn't go down like i would get down but i had no control so i'd either fall over or i just wouldn't be able to get back up yeah, but then you know it, it yeah well <laughs> it's a matter of your body and your brain just going I'm learning yeah. to coordinate this. I'm learning to coordinate yeah. this. And I could feel that process happening. I was like, okay, yeah, now it doesn't too. feel as crampy. Okay, I yeah. feel like I'm actually um, improving my strength in this position. Okay, that's happening. Now my brain is saying, okay, well, why don't you do this so that you're more stable in the movement? Why don't you do that when you say yeah. you're more stable in the movement? It's not like I'm having that conversation in my head. It's just it's just figured it out it's through just, trial and error. It's just doing it, isn't it? Yeah, it's just yeah, exactly. It's like uh, that's what I was saying about a conversation between brain and body. So I just figured it out, and it's like okay, now I can do it on both sides. And like you know, it's not it's like one side is like my left side is relatively clean if I'm balancing on my so left they, leg. Yeah. Right side still not still not that clean, but I can do it now, right? So it's um, and it sounds like it's like it looks like it's a ridiculous movement to use. It looks it's, look, it's a great movement. It's an impressive movement, if you ask me. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, is what. Well, and it's like you know what's the what's the what's the point as well is like the, re the only reason off. i started doing it. <laughs> yeah well the only reason i started doing it was because a friend of mine who I used to work with sent me this guy doing it he does the exact move but then he taps his shoulder on the floor and then comes oh, back wow. up from there as well and i was like how do you even do that yeah like, what the right hell is this can you send me that and, video like that that you should yeah. have that on your wall and that's what we're going to yeah. try and do you know that's it so it was like <laughs> what the hell is that i've never seen that before all right Amazing. and because i'm like I'm amongst this crew is like i'm the mobility guy so it's like okay if anybody yeah, can yeah. do it Karina might be able yeah. to do it so she sent it to me and i did it i was like oh no i'm like halfway down and i'm just like falling all over the shop and uh and i'm thinking okay this is ridiculous but then again my brain just went kicked into gear it got that yeah. agitation from that little bit of strain and it got that yeah. um uh, it's a challenge that is totally at the edge of my capacity yeah. and uh, hit that flow state. And then it's just the, the pathway start like uh, opening up, the gateways opened up for neuroplasticity yeah. and it's just like my brain's gone, okay, keep going, keep going, keep going. It's like a, when a baby's learning to walk, you know, they fall yeah. over a thousand times right. and they can finally yeah. walk. It's the same thing here is like, okay, I'm going to fall over a thousand times, but my brain will eventually figure out how to do this movement. Get it. And yeah. yeah. And then that's what it felt like. I was like, okay, the coordination improved, the balance improved, the stability yeah. improved, um, the strength improved um, over the space of a few weeks to be able to hold my it's leg up into help. that position and back. Yeah. And then there you go. So that's a lesson in like, hey, just persevere with it because it looks like it's something impossible right now, but yeah. you can do it. And like the Absolutely. number of times I've had clients go, you're never going to be able to make me do that. That's just not going to happen. I'm like, cool, just do Watch it. Me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, and they go, what? Well, they go, well, of course you can do it. I'm like, yeah, I'm something for you to aspire to, maybe. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, it's the, 
but but they but they just go this is never going to happen and then i'm like okay fine you do the movement and then you know no way near executing it is like 10 percent of the way there it's like see i can't do it it's like no no you're not going to stop now do it again do it again carry on. do it again do it again we didn't then, just yeah, literally perfect like, it yeah no exactly and literally like within half an hour like uh, i remember this like particularly with one client um he, he just looked at me he was like oh wow i didn't think i'd be able to do that you know and it's like yeah uh, it's like, yeah, it's a good feeling. Good feeling to be able to show somebody what they're Amazing. actually capable of. But also it's a great feeling yeah, for them to be absolutely. like, <laughs> you like literally half an hour ago, I was saying, I'll pay you like a stupid amount of money if I could ever do that. And then <laughs> within half an hour, they're just like, I'm like, where's my check? Give me my money, show me my money. But I ain't gonna get that money, but there hey, you go. <laughs> the, the body is working the way <laughs> you never thought it would. So that's a big victory. I'll just take that. I'm happy with that. That's my payment. <laughs> Well, and, and, and that's a beautiful thing, but also what I love about um, learning new movements. So something like that, where you think it's never, you're, or it's going to be really tricky, and you're never going to do it. But actually, so I was practicing it yesterday, the, the dragonfly squat, and it's really hard. And I toggle over on my right side. But what I noticed, I then went for a run afterwards. And I mm. felt so much stronger having yeah. practiced, you know, what is essentially like a very, very difficult single leg squat with lots of mobility, lots of like strength within the joint capsule, my legs felt stronger. So I like that when it's a difficult exercise, it has a knock on effect in other areas of whatever it is that you're trying to do in your life, in your cardio, whatever. Um, and that's, that's what we do. That's why we teach what we teach, isn't it? It's like, no, you might not be able to do this now, but you will be able to, and that's going to have a knock on effect within your life in other areas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it just shows you as okay, well, it's just essentially the biggest thing about it is patience and perseverance. If I have that, yeah, then I'll eventually get there. And even if it's like, yeah. even if I couldn't, even if I just couldn't get to that, you know, that final degree of the movement where I feel stable and I'm just not getting there, it's like, I've learned a shit ton about my body just doing that in a short space of time. Hell of a it's lot. Like it's highlighted yeah. to me how to deal with my deal with my weaknesses. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, that's that's the least you're gonna get out of it. Yeah. And and you know, it's and it's that whole thing again of over time, you might go away, not think about it for a couple of weeks and then come back and be like, Oh, I can do it. And that's the beauty of neuroplasticity as well. It's like just give yes. yourself time, give yourself your mind, your body time to to just generate those pathways and then you might actually be able to do it in a couple of weeks time so i you know i'm going to leave it alone for a couple of days come back to it see see how i go and then and then yeah and then then i might video it in my shorts no <laughs> <laughs> you know i can do this if I, if I it's like if i can do that then it's like yep yeah, that means i've nailed it i'm good yeah yeah exactly yeah. exactly um that's but yeah, cool. that, I love um, I love all our challenges. It's so much fun. I love I love. You're like, hey, try this, and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and then and then and then and then we've tried that that one where you have got the stick on the foot, and and yeah. not a chance, not a chance. Uh, I'm like, really? is that stick? Yeah, really. It's like I don't know whether, and I'm going to blame my tools. I don't know whether that my stick is too big. <laughs> I'm oh, too heavy. Um, but I was literally watching your video going. Is that stuck to his foot? Because yeah, I taped it. I didn't. I didn't tell you that. You did, I taped you? it down. No, yeah, I, I bet didn't. you did. <laughs> so, no, I know you did. Yeah, again, again, anyone who's not anyone who's like obviously hadn't seen doesn't know what the hell we're talking about. But it's just basically no, I, I know. I'm sorry. Stick, yeah, they call it the yeah. voodoo stick trick. It's just basically you get a five foot dowel or the end of a broom. Basically, is a broomstick, and you just yeah. balance it on the soles of your feet while you're lying on your back. But what you end so up doing hard. is. But what you end up doing is a circle. You you spin around with that stick intact. It doesn't move. It stays yeah. on your feet. And um, so because, like, okay, so it took me, obviously it took me some practice as well, right, to get that right. Yeah. But, oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's like, okay, he, he couldn't, he wasn't just born with it. He couldn't just do it. <laughs> so, like, you should know that by now. Is uh, yeah, just took a bit of practice, and then yeah. when I nailed it, I was like, "Oh my god!" Like, and it's a workout without good. it feeling like a workout because yeah, that was definitely right. a situation where I was like, 45 minutes um, from the, like the first time I tried, I was like, 45 minutes. I was like, "I'm so in the zone with this. There's no way I'm stopping until I get this." I love it. Yeah, it was flow. just set Got up a bit like flow. that. Yeah. yeah, that's it. And then the next day, like my core and my hips were on fire. 
and oh, it just I bet. felt so good. Yeah. And then so right. you know, again, it's like it, the kind of control that you have is like with that stick is just like the coordination that you're building up and that your right. understanding right. that your body's gaining of how to control itself in space. And knowing where your different limbs are in space, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, there's a point where you're not looking at your feet because you've turned away yeah. from them. And so to be like, okay, well, I've still got the stick here and noticing when it's kind of off balance and it's not going to land on your feet. Yeah. That uh, it's going to come off your feet even and uh, land on the floor. It's like, that's, that's, that's awesome. It's like to have that kind of control is a really it's amazing. Feeling. Yeah. Could you do it now? Cause that, that, that video was taken a little while ago, wasn't it? Could you do it now? Yeah, actually, funny enough, I did it. Um, yeah, I did it on the week. I did it on the weekend. <laughs> yeah. I was like, let me check in with this. Yeah, I was like, let me check in with this, and I was like, bam, done, still got it. He still got it. Damn it! Damn it! He still got I it. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. I literally like so you start upright, don't you? You start lying on your back, start upright, um, that way, yeah. and you have to twist over. And as soon as I start to get over, slides off, mm. and I, I, I'm just like, maybe I haven't got the feet for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just blame everything except yourself. <laughs> like, My feet me. don't work. I've got the wrong <laughs> stick. It's clearly just everything, but not me. <laughs> what, what but we'll the do other is, one so, yeah, that I said, we'll, <laughs> yeah, we'll, well, do, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah, we'll get together for a flow jab and I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to show you how to do this. Okay, and you'll just laugh at me. And the other one where you've got the stick <laughs> holding on and you're trying to walk away, walk down, I was like, no, that's no, I can't, I cannot. Yeah, so, so, yeah. But there's stick, so many fun things. Stick planted in the yeah, stick planted in the ground, and you're just uh, basically you're moving your hands down the stick, so your body's yeah. move moving uh, moving down, but keeping it strong, still, um, long long spine. So essentially, it's a hell of a core workout. And I was it's looking at massive. it, I was like, oh, that, that, that's face plant. No. I actually, I tried that as Nine. well. On the, no, <laughs> no. I tried that on the weekend as well, and I was like, "Yep, yeah, that's that's hard. That is some serious, oh, serious work." Something to aspire to. Something to aspire to, yeah. right? That mm -hmm. and backflipping. Yeah. yeah, that and backflipping. Why not? And uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's like you know, you do these things. You're building capacity in your body, and yeah. uh, for like you know, for meeting challenges that you want to throw at yourself, in the sense that because. Um, it's, yeah, similar to you, a lot of my clients have suffered from some, some sort of injury or some sort of pain and mm -hmm. tends to be lower back pain often. Yeah. And, um, and that's what people end up coming to me for is like, what I tell them is like, you know, your threshold for movement is pretty low. Like uh, anybody watching yeah. this, I've got like my hands together, kind of like a, like a level and, and it's kind of low. So any movement that you make can trigger the discomfort in your back because yeah. you just don't have much threshold for it. But what you're doing by building the awareness, by building the coordination, by building efficiency and the movement that you have and mm -hmm. uh, understanding how, and education is part of it as well, understanding how your body works and then also mindset is a part of it as well, just knowing that there is a route out. There isn't, it's like, you know, you're not a, you're not a fucked up mess. You have a way out of this. You just need no, to know what it is. You, and you need to change your mind yeah. about how you approach it. You start to do that and then your threshold starts to rise and you know with the movements that you're making as well the threshold starts to rise so the any movements that you make don't trigger that pain as much because you've got a bit more of a yeah. buffer and then with the kind of challenges that myself and Jude are doing is okay I'm building my threshold in a new way new way new way and so I do that and so again another challenge I can increase the challenge that I place on my body and it won't mess with me it won't break me yeah. because I have an yeah. even bigger buffer between what I need to do on a regular basis and what I'm actually capable of doing so yes. that difference between the two is quite big mm -hmm. so I'm well within my means all the time and then therefore I don't have to experience discomfort and pain yeah Definitely. And I think, you know, we, I often post some of the challenges that we do on Instagram and a lot of my clients are like, how can you do that? Like, I would just fall over or you make that look so easy. And it's like, mm. what everything you just said kind of encapsulates that, that, you know, we have this baseline. I've got a spinal issue. I'm with you guys. I've got back pain, but like you, you just do all this rehab, this movement, but it's, it's everything else around it. It's the mindset. It's the, it's how you mm. think about that pain. It's like, I have a really big belief system where I'm like, 
uh, it's not that I don't believe that I'm never going to get injured. It's just I believe I, I can recover from any injury that I get. It's it's just it's mm -hmm. something that's just ingrained within me. It's like I know that I'm gonna I'm gonna be able to to recap or re, sorry rehab from that. Um, and then yeah, so once you have that baseline of strength and mobility and stability, despite whatever back condition, you can then up it and and do those crazier movements. I think I, I posted a sissy squat the other day and people were like, how do you do that? And it's yeah. like, I just have that strength because I've built up to it. You know, I, I do a lot of stuff around rehab. So it's not that I just knocked it out. It was like a little bit of practice and then my body can just do that sort of stuff. So, and you can too. You just have to build up to it. So I, I genuinely think, you know, I, I hope that what I post online is inspiring and not just like, ugh, you know, because I want people to know that they can absolutely reach that. They've just got to put in a little mm. bit of time and a bit of dedication. Bit of belief. Belief, absolutely. Belief is a big part of it Sprinkle though, isn't in. it? Sprinkle mm. that in. But it is a big, big part of it. And actually I've just written a bit about beliefs and how if we we don't have that belief system or we have a certain belief system ingrained within us like mm. i'm never going to get better uh i'm always going to feel like this i don't deserve to get better that kind of thing then then how is your body supposed to heal if those thoughts are you know protruding through your mind the whole time if you can change that belief system that's going to have a, an effect on everything, your mind, your body, your lifestyle, your movement, it's its key, I think. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. It's just like like the way you, what you think is like, you know, I believe I'm correct in saying this is the effect that it has on you, like the thoughts that you produce are no different to how your brain processes them in, uh, compared to the actions that you produce. Yes. I think yeah, I think we're gonna have to confirm that for sure. But basically, the point yeah. is, and it's um, yeah, the way you think about something has obviously a direct impact on how you um, uh, what you're going you to use. achieve. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, because again, that like you know, noting on comparison is like somebody's seeing kind of like the finished article. Let's say it's the finished article of you doing that sissy squat. Sissy squat is basically bending fully at the knees, keeping the hips steady. You're just bending the knees yeah. towards the ground with your heels off the ground and then coming back up from there. So it's basically a heavy load on the quads and the knees. Yeah. And um, so somebody's looking at that and being like, oh my God, I'll never be able to do that. And then just give up from it, right? Yeah, but, um, dumb. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but they haven't, they haven't seen uh, like the behind the scenes, like, you know, BTS, like what's going on there? What, uh, what have you done to actually get to that yeah. level? And if you see that, it's like the number of screw ups that you have and the number of times you fell over, yeah. the number of times you thought, nope, not going there, my knee's going to pop out, I'm not going to do that, yeah. nope, nope, nope. All of that. But you've just gradually built up to it. And so if instead the approach is, oh, I'm never going to be able to do that, that looks too hard, is like, oh no, just a bit of practice, a bit of perseverance, and I'll be able to get there. It means yeah. you actually get started, you know, it actually means that's massive. you make a difference. Yeah. Yeah, and that's huge. So mm. just by starting and then following through that process and just keep believing is like, okay, it's just a matter of practice, perseverance, practice, perseverance, practice, perseverance. You just keep saying those words mm. to yourself and things uh, things invariably get better. But that that's the key, isn't it? It's starting because then that kicks in that dopamine reward mindset, doesn't it? Of, you know, mm. if you start and you reward the process, those incremental stages, even if you can't do a sissy squat, right? You start, you start, you squat great so mm. and that then creates like a little bit of a reward system that little bit of dopamine release that you and i often talk about and and then you start incrementally improving and and, and, and building on those steps and rewarding those little steps along the way it's like it's like running a marathon isn't it you don't just go out your door and run 26 miles as a beginner you've got you've got to start and human talks about this it's like you have to start by i don't know putting your shoes by the door and then maybe going out and then maybe once you get out you start a little bit of a run and then you carry on from there and it's it's about rewarding those little stages those little bits each time that build up to the bigger goal if you're like sissy squat now i'm never going to do that then that's probably right whereas if you start with a squat or bending your knees 
and then you know in a week's time you do something else then then having that i think that also creating that positivity and those positive steps towards that end goal will mean that you're going to get there it might not be yeah. in six months it might be in a year but you are going to do it whereas if you don't start then you are going to keep that mindset of i'm never, never going to be do i'm never going to do that so mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly it's just incremental steps it's like what you alluded rewarding to, each like, process you're so yeah yeah we're already stages process oh, oh i did this today it's like it can be yeah. small it's like because it's like a lot of times we're just so used to just being like it only matters when i get there it's like mm -hmm. nah because by adopting that mindset then the whole journey is a pain in the ass basically yeah and the yeah. more of a pain in the ass that it is the less chance you have of actually succeeding and getting there because there's so many opportunities for you to just give up you know, because exactly. oh, this is so difficult but if you're just like oh this is difficult but it's worth it there's a reward yeah. here you're subjectively increasing your um uh, increasing your um uh, uh re yeah essentially your reward mechanism and mm. uh, subjectively increasing your uh perception of the effort improving your perception of the effort that's, that's it that's you're massive. rewarding the effort process mm. yeah you reward the effort process yeah. not just the end goal you know, the end goal, it's like, it's going to maybe take ages. So if you reward the effort process incrementally over the time it takes to get towards that goal and breaking it into those bite-sized chunks, that that is going to help almost preserve and contain all the neurochemicals that you need to help you to reach that end goal. You know, you're basically yeah. bite-sizing it, and that's really important. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Bite sized chunks, incremental gains, and compounding interest. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So, another cool thing that we wanted to chat about was um, yeah. something that you get a lot of inquiries about, which was mm -hmm. diastasis recti. Absolutely. So, yes. Yeah. So, this is, um, yeah, it's kind of like in my mind in recent times. And then we were talking about it. It's like, this would be something that's good to talk about because there's a lot of, yeah. say, there's a lot of. Uh, misgivings about it. There's a lot of um, yeah. mis there's it, it's misunderstood. There's a lot yes. of myths around it as well. Like mm -hmm. um, uh, f especially for women, and just thinking you know it's just something you have to live with. It's not recoverable. That kind of stuff. First of all, explain what it is, um, why sure. it tends to happen, and what the process is for actually overcoming it. So diastasis recti is the separation of the abdominal muscles, in particular. Uh, I suppose I should say the six pack muscle, which is called the rectus abdominis. Um, it basically attaches onto this line that runs from just below our breastbone to just above our pubic bone, or they attach onto those points. That's called the linea alba. It's like a tenderness muscle that is, is basically, um, if I kind of regress back, when we're in the womb and, and, and we're, we're, we're babies in the womb, um, our organs actually uh, get made on top, and then at the end, just before we're born, everything gets put into into inside the linea alba, then gets stitched up. So it's like that midline point. So the ab abdominals separate away from the midline. The linea alba opens, and it basically happens with rapid weight gain. So predominantly in females that are pregnant or have just given birth. But also it happens in males or anyone that puts on rapid weight. So it, it, I have had a few male clients that have had uh, you know, small abdominal separations, um, but the main clientele are pregnant females, post-pregnant females. And <clears throat> what, is, what tends to happen with the diastasis recti, and I've had a lot of people that have come that have had maybe the DR for a year, two years, sometimes eight years. Sometimes it can be like three centimetres, which is considered quite big. Sometimes it can be one, um, which is like a lot of people walk around with one, like guys are walking around with one, one centimetre of DR. Um, and what tends to happen, obviously, when a, a, a woman is pregnant, they've obviously got to make room for the baby. The baby sits at the front. And within that, because of that, the front area expands and then the sides, so in particular the oblique muscles, tend to shorten. So we get this kind of wide angle at the front, the obliques tend to shorten and at the back we get something called a hyperlordosis. 
surfaces is where the lumbar spine tends to overextend and push forward. So we get this very kind of pressed forward position. And what you tend to see on people or women that have this postnatal position, they have uh, the, the separation, is that oblique area is still quite short. Sometimes it might be short on one side and then it might be long on the other side, but you tend to get that hypolordosis where they overextend through the lumbar spine, maybe a little bit higher, and they have this abdominal separation. And what often happens when you get them to breathe and, and, and assess their breathing is that they breathe really, really well through the front. They have this really nice anterior breathing, but the lateral side and often around the back as well is, is quite shut down. They can't quite get that, that movement into their sides and into their back. And I won't go into the anatomy because I feel like it's probably a little bit too, um, a bit too much. But basically, the what's called the internal abdominal bleak is key when you're rehabbing diastasis recti because there's uh, those sheaths that attach onto this midline, and the uh, internal abdominal bleak uh, attaches onto the front of the sheaths and the back of the sheaths, and these sheaths kind of sit between or sit in front of and at the back of the rectus abdominis, which is the muscle that you can see. So I won't go on about that because it all gets a bit technical. But basically that's the area that we really want to try and rehab when we're looking at diastasis recti. And as I said, you often get this kind of shortening on one side or shortening on both sides. And if you kind of feel around rib 10, which is where the internal abdominal bleak attaches onto, it often gets a little bit niggly and a little bit gnarly. So it's really, really simple. You get most postnatal mums to breathe well, breathe obviously anteriorly, which is often really good, but then just get them to breathe into their lateral sides as well, into their back as well. And that just gets everything functioning and firing a bit better. Also, you would maybe get them to do stretches to open out the obliques and something that I would call pendulums to really get the obliques to fire and function better and elongate. And we're trying to get them out of that kind of locked position and into a more functional position. And then that in turn will then start to close the linear alba together. Um, and then once they've got that, because often a lot of the complaints are back pain and things like they just mm -hmm. feel weak at the front. They just feel a bit cut off. They feel like they haven't got the support and the strength to bend down and pick their baby up. And everything just feels a little bit off. So once they start to get that connectivity here, um, everything starts to feel a bit more unified, a bit stronger, a bit more coordinated, a bit more stable. And they feel like they can get down and back up. They don't feel like they've got this pressure into their lower spine because essentially you've opened out and mobilized the little small stabilizing muscles around their lower spine as well. So it's, it's a really nice thing to work with, not a nice thing because women quit, get quite distressed by it, but it's a fairly quick fix um, with pretty simple exercises. And it, it's, um, it, it happens quite quickly for most people, like literally just doing breath work and knowing where you're looking at, getting them to do things like exercises like cat camels, so you get that stability and mobility into the, the muscles in the lumbar spine area. And, and just getting them to engage their core and work on that intra-abdominal pressure as well. It, it, um, it does happen pretty quickly. And yeah, they tend to feel stronger after that. And they're more able to, to, to do things that they need to do with their baby as well. So it, it's a good thing to work with. I hope that was a good ex explanation. Sometimes it's, it's like how, because when you're with a client, you're like, you just kind of, da, 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 you do it and you know what you're doing, but to actually have to explain it, it's like, ah, I hope it's okay. <laughs> Got to, good to get that communication, right? Is that, this, that ability to communicate something as simply as possible, but no simpler. It's, it's very, very difficult. Simple. Yeah. 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 It's a good, it's a good skill to adopt. That was cool. That's, um, yeah. Cause at what stage? Do women tend to come to you um, with uh, with the issue? With the DR? Um, it's a really good question. So a lot of the time, and um, what interests me as well is that a lot of women don't even know that they've got a diastasis recti or they're not really aware of what that means or 
or a, a, a midwife might point it out on their three month or six month review. I think it's probably a three month review of just checking like where they are, postnatal, how the baby is. So often it will get picked up or often it might get picked up a little way down the line when they're complaining of back pain and and it hasn't really gone away and their baby's one years old or two years old and 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 they just feel a bit disconnected, a bit, a bit, I, I often get people saying they just feel a bit weird at the front and that nothing seems to be working right and they're doing all this stuff but nothing seems to be improving. So often it's a year down the line. I've had someone that came to me who was eight years down the line and, and it's interesting with women as well that are fitter, they tend to just crack on and, and try and want to get back to their the kind of normal routine quite quickly. I've had a lot of women over the years that are just like, I just want to crack on and do some hits and running and, and you know, Pilates and all the stuff that I, I, I used to do. And, and that's when you often find that the DR is kind of still there a little bit because, it, it you know, it, through no one's fault, they just wanted to get on with, you know, the, the stuff that they've been used to doing. And that's when the stuff can be really effective as well because just by a bit of breathing and knitting everything back together, getting the fleets to, to open out a little bit, getting the lumbar spine to start functioning a bit better, um, it, it all just feels a lot stronger and then they can actually carry on with their running and their hits. And for me, it was, I just wanted to get back to Thai boxing and martial arts. So yeah, it, um, it really does depend. But often, I'd say probably the average time is about two years down the line. People kind of come and go, hey, I've got this separation. Um, that's not normal, is it? Uh, can you help me? And it's like, yeah, absolutely, of course. Mm. So one of the things which I think is a common misconception is doing core work, core work mm -hmm. in, in inverted commas, and then that'll solve the problem. And often it doesn't, and I can imagine that's one of the reasons why it's somewhere down the line, like a couple of years down the line, where women will tend to come to yeah. you. Um, explain why that's not going to be the fix. Like, okay, I've got yeah. diastasis recti, all right, all right, fine, I'm just going to do some core work and I'll be fine. And six months later, yeah. eight months later, a year later, you're like, oh, it hasn't resolved what the yeah. hell's going on. In fact, I might even be in yeah. worse shape. Like I don't have that connection with my core. I'm, my yeah. core is actually weaker, you know, which is paradoxical to them. So explain why mm -hmm. that's not the answer. I think it depends on what you mean by core exercises. But if you're doing like really heavy core exercises where you've got that load of mm. your legs up in the air and then you're sending your legs out and you haven't got that um, connectability and that functionality within your core, but also if you're doing curl-ups and sit ups and rotation and you're basically exacerbating the problem because everything hasn't closed up if you haven't knitted back together and then you're trying to do these big like long lever core exercises or doing mm. the planks which by the way are fine but that within time and within the right process yes. and the right amount of um like time frame planks are fine but it's, it's just going to exacerbate everything, especially if you're doing kind of obliquey work, you're basically, you know, setting the obliques in this kind of short, pressed forward position. Whereas if we stretch everything out and get everything to open out and then get that breathing, that the breathing mechanics functioning better, and it almost feels counterintuitive because I'm getting people to breathe in and expand and stretch and open. And they're like, this doesn't feel right. And it's like, trust me, you have to be able to stretch a muscle to contract it, load to explode, right? So if, if those muscles are just there and this and then you're doing all this, you're basically strengthening that diastasis recti in place and nothing's mm -hmm. going to knit back together. Whereas if you just start to stretch and then move back and get everything a bit more pliable and get everything at the back to actually start to connect and kick in to get rid of that really, really dysfunctional lordosis, then that's when everything, we talked about symmetry earlier, that's where everything's gonna to start to become a little bit more symmetrical, a little bit more like the neurodevelopment stuff that we talk about as well, where we wanna walk properly, we wanna move better, we wanna have more functional movement everything comes back to finding that position of the core and being able to breathe better so that your diaphragm can move better and create better core stability. Core work, the right core work is key. Core work, as, as I know some people know it, like 
that's going to make it worse. So I hope that mm. kind of answers that. Yeah, that's hugely important. So yeah, core work. You yeah, you nailed it. Like you know, doing twists, doing crunches, curl ups, yeah. doing long lever stuff like bicycle crunches, and doing um, uh, what else? Yeah, like planks. Like you said, have their place because they're a lot more. Yes. Let's if we're using the word functional, then. Um, than other exercises. However, they've got to be brought in at the right time yeah. because they can be overloading, overloading a pattern, really? which is, yeah. which is not, which is not right for the body uh, at that given time. You have to improve the function first and then load that function to Im improve yes. the endurance of that function yes. and improve the strength of that function. So yeah. yeah, you have to bring it back to basics and yeah, there's people, um, women will struggle, especially like the, the fitter community, like you mentioned is like, they're like, uh, mm. you know, I want to get back to hit. I want to get back to running. I want to do all this and that. Yeah. And I get you, have that. To, you have to rent, yeah, you have to rent it in though. It's like, you have to understand that if you actually want yeah. this to sort itself out, then you got to do the prerequisite work. And not only when you mm. do that work, will it sort the diocesis recti, but your body's going to be so much more efficient that when you go back to that work and you build up your endurance again, you're yeah. probably going to actually, if you do PRs, like if you track your progress and stuff, you're probably going to PR on some stuff mm. as well because you've got a functioning core yeah. again. And at the end of the day, it's Absolutely. called the core only because, only because it's where, like, basically, essentially, movement kind of gets uh, prepared for by the core. Like, you know, the brain says, hey, we're about mm -hmm. to make a movement and your muscles around the spine brace. And then you start to make your movement. Obviously, this happens in microseconds, milliseconds. It's not something that we're fully aware of. But yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's where movement begins. So if you're able yeah. to do that, you will notice how much more efficient you are. You will actually feel like you're breathing, like straight away opens up and you can take more oxygen in and feel uh, like you have more energy just because you've corrected these patterns and corrected yeah. the diastasis. And that again, feeds forward into the exercises and the activities that you do. So yeah, Absolutely. work on the basics, get those fundamentals right. And then when you have those fundamentals, everything else becomes a lot stronger and a lot more efficient and you're a much more effective human being. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, the pain's going to go and, and everything feels more connected and more, more often than not, the pain goes and they just feel more balanced overall. Mm. And I think when they start to feel that, it's actually a really lovely thing to see when you work with postnatal mums and... They come to you and, and they're like, everything hurts. I'm just tired and it's hard. And and then they're like, I picked up my baby without pain for the first time. And you're like, yeah, that that's mm. what it's all about. That's what you want to happen. And yeah, I, and it happens quickly. Yeah, it happens quickly. Like they and and you know, they so want to what's, to feel better. Mm, yeah. yeah. What's quick to you? Like what when you say it happens quickly? Uh, what's a good time frame usually in, in your experience? Weeks. What you dealt with? Four weeks, generally. Mm. I think I, you know, you. Mm. So I've been teaching someone now for her. She's done four sessions now, four or five sessions, and her diastasis diastasis is in. Um, I think it was two, two above the umbilicus, and it's now in, and uh, and she couldn't pick her baby up before. It was hurting to bangs. She's got disc herniation, um, and now better, all, all a lot better. You know, it happens quickly. If they're dedicated yeah. and they do the exercises in between sessions, it happens, mm. you know, and they're committed and there's consistency. It happens quickly. And and, and yeah. the thing with diastasis recti is it's a quick result. Uh, you know, I, I like to see results. And it's, it's one of those ones where you see results quite quickly. Like the actual physicality mm. of a gap closing up, like you test it every week, you see how they are every week, you see what their position is every week. And it changes over time and you can just see it in them as well. Yeah. It's like every week they look better yeah. and they look more with it and they they, they have more energy and, and it, it's yeah. actually lovely to see. Um, it's one of my favorite things to teach actually. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. And um, I think you, you said something really important. I think it's worth reiterating as well is mm. do the work, right? You've got to be committed to the process as well. You've got to be doing yeah. the work in between seeing you as the practitioner who's guiding the process and they're like, okay, do everything that is necessary to make this happen. You're going to get the results mm -hmm. quickly. If you don't do those things, then just be okay with the fact that it's not going to happen in yeah. the nature that you want it to happen. Um, so yeah, do the work, commit to it and um, bring, that, bring that level to it and you're going to get the result. Exactly. But the thing with, with, um, postnatal mums is that I'm not tough on them because 
I know what it's like to have a newborn and you're you're fucking all over the show it's just it's it's hard and it's like it's like a new job that you haven't had time to prepare for and you have no idea what you're doing and so I'm I'm very careful with with new mums and I'm like mm. look I need you mm. to do one minute of breathing once a day yeah. or mm -hmm. a couple of minutes of breathing every other day and they're like okay, I can, I can do that. I can do that. And, and if it, whereas if you're like, no, you need to do five exercises three, three times a day, they're not gonna be able to do it. So I'm, I'm very, very careful yeah. how I approach the, the kind of regular, it's like, just fit in what you can just try and remember mm -hmm. these techniques when you're when you're lifting your baby up or when you're watching TV, maybe just get down on the floor and do a minute of breathing. It's like, you gotta be able to fit in with their time schedule because their time schedule is yeah. all over the show right now and that yeah. baby because it's number one it's them but she or she is the most important thing and the mum is like very much like their health they know it's important but nothing's as important as the baby so you have to try and be yeah. very careful and fit around and go look you just gotta get one minute of breathing in if you can do that for me that's awesome and i can work with that and then you yeah. go from there so yeah. mindset yeah, exactly. again yeah, incremental exactly. stages yeah. reward processing yeah. isn't it yeah, that's yeah. Part yeah. of that commitment is just like I'm going to commit what I can to it, right? It's yes. like I'm just I'm I'm going to be able to do this, and it's like it's basically there's no way I'm not doing it. It's yeah. I'm just going to I'm going to figure out how to make this happen. I guess that's part. Yeah. Of, um, I guess that'd be part of the process. Is like okay, yeah. time is all over the shop. Like there's yeah. like there's no such thing as time management. So nothing. What, what window do you have where you can actually make this work? You know. Is when you feel you okay and you actually feel human mm. yeah because it's like yeah it's it's hard mm. so you know it's it's yeah. it's having that mental capacity if i'm honest mm. to actually get down on the floor prepare yourself to get down on the floor and go what did you tell me to do again and then actually do yeah. it so it mm. doesn't take one minute it actually takes a whole half a day to actually figure out how mm. to get down on that floor and do that breathing so uh, that's why i'm mm. very very sort of careful with how I get new mum to to start to it, like it, put this mm. into their day um yeah and generally that works so yeah cool no it makes a lot of sense is, um, yeah. yeah trying to figure out everything else around it as well is, uh, it's like, okay here's the diocese yeah. but like where's where's it fit where is it in the bigger picture you know, like, how do we make it yeah. so that you can take care of this while you're raising a new human being yes exactly yeah. and i think it is just it's what we were talking about earlier it's like you just have to do these like very very small incremental steps and not look at that big picture too much and go it's going to go yeah. in don't worry about that whatever you do as long as you, you know, you're here you found me and that's a great start because you know i can help you work with this but it, it just don't worry about the end end goal you're going to feel better it's just it's going to take a bit of time mm. and we'll work around the baby so and and yeah i think just having that is important for them to know that mm. you're on their side and and you want mm. them to get better and it doesn't matter about the time frame mm. yeah okay yeah that's um yeah certainly like food for thought is like because mm. it's something that i go through with um like with my clients is basically okay let's work out where in your week you're going to be able to do the things that you said you want to move forward on it's like it's not even like okay i'm guiding sure. the process but it's like it's like here's the several things that you need to really work on like yeah what are you what are you going to prioritize and what can you do and then when can you do it yeah and and it's like it's not so that you know it's not for me to know it's like for them to know but all i'm all yeah. that's going to happen is obviously i'm going to ask about it right and it's like there's that accountability factor there as well yes. and um and so and so part of the process is because i mean regardless of whether you're a new mom or not is um in in this case where he's doing diocesis for other people it's like you know taking on a new routine where okay it could yes. be to solve back problem it could be to get fitter get healthier all of that kind of stuff you're gonna to have to make time for it, you know. You've got to figure out sure. where you can where you can fit that in, and um, and it's never perfect. It's never going to be perfect no. to begin with. It's like it's all about that process. It's all about progress. Is way way better than perfection because if you keep thinking about perfection, you're never going to do it. If you keep yeah. thinking about okay, what's that one little thing I could do? It's like okay, I've done that, built that in, and then what's the next little thing? And what's the next little thing? And what's the next yes. little thing? And before you know it, 
your your lifestyle and the way you approach your health, your physical fitness, your lower back problem, or your diastasis is like you know your your miles better than where you were, even though it's just a little bit of change every yeah. single day. And and so it's that, um, that's it, yeah, though, just, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And just accepting that that's got to be a part of it because, you know, it's going to be difficult to make time. But um, at yeah. the end of the day, if it's a priority, it's like find that time, make that time. You will. I, th- I think, you know, just yeah. having regular sessions with a trainer, that's that's like layer one, isn't it? It's like that's mm. how you start this whole process. To have that booked in every week, knowing that that's coming every single week, that's layer one. And then you build around that. I think so the very fact that they've got in touch and they're they're starting sessions and they want to commit to them and generally you know with clients whether they're here for the long haul and they're going to commit or whether it, it's not going to happen I think mm-hmm. um and mm-hmm. and you know and 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 then they can build from there so yeah I think it's it's a different time for everyone mm. yeah okay it's cool but in, in like in this case with DR with diastasis recti mm. More often than not, you've seen it happen work out within four weeks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. You know, sometimes it takes how a little much, bit longer. How much does that? Hmm, how much does that depend on like the the size of the issue? Because you had mentioned about you know, the separation can be three centimeters, which is considered big. So mm-hmm. like, you know, essentially, how many fingers can you get into that gap? Yeah. Um, one centimeter yeah. can be quite small. Is like, how much does that matter? I think it depends on the individual and what they've been doing around. Okay i.e. what fitness they've been doing around the DR, what they've been doing, okay. what else is going on. It, it, it's quite individualised, I think, um, because sometimes people, people can be walking around with one centimetre and it could have been strengthened in that position. And that's actually possibly a little bit harder to get rid of than someone that has a three centimetre DR and hasn't been doing any kind of strengthening around it. And generally, they're, they're, they close up quite quickly. So... Okay. It really does depend on on the individual, mm. I think. Yeah, cool. Yeah, circumstances and what they've been doing for it. Yes. How long they had it. Yeah. Is more important yeah. than the size of it. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't even know about how long they've had it, if I'm honest. Like, okay. I've had people come and it's been, you know, a good few years and, and that's closed up within six weeks, like a three centimetre DR, eight years post, that's closed up over six weeks so I, I really think it's individualized but generally if a, if a mm. postnatal mum's come to you pretty soon after giving birth that will close in pretty quickly four weeks mm. usually yeah okay yeah yeah cool yeah so it's just yeah it's kind of it hasn't you know, no bad patterns have been ingrained over no over but that, also uh, diastasis. yeah I think sorry there was just one thing that came to mind also you have to kind of take into account things like whether the mum is breastfeeding and things like that because it means that there's a hormone within her body that's still there called relaxing, which is how the the body kind of helps to encompass the baby as the baby gets bigger. So as you know, as the mum stops breastfeeding and the hormone goes, um, that's also a really good time to to mm. kind of start doing all that sort of stuff. So that could be again that's that's up to the individual it could be three months could be six months could be 12 months could be 18 months so it depends how long that the, the mum's going to breastfeed for as well mm, yeah um but generally you can get it in yeah mm. okay that's good that's powerful stuff so that good. also yeah, that comes back around to functional movement right is um absolutely you, you sort that out you build that functional movement um, yeah and you're a lot more, yeah, a lot more efficient, a lot more coordinated, and uh, you're going to be better off having dealt with it. So a lot more efficient. So, okay, so, and that just brings to mind as well, you're talking about um, some women who don't know that they've been walking around with a diastasis. Mm. Uh, yeah. So how, what are the, like, symptoms? What are, what's, uh, what are the symptoms and what are the signs that they have it? How can they notice, especially if they've you know, had a baby and they're not sure? Yeah, I think it would be things like back pain, feeling um, feeling really weak in their center, central area, uh, just feeling like 
this doesn't feel right. And and they're often have things like, oh, when I sit up, there's like a bulge as well. Like they'll mm-hmm. get up and be like, what's that? And and there'll be like a little bulge where the linear alba, that, that tennis bit of muscle is still apart and they'll get like a, a push through, that kind of thing. And it will generally just manifest as weakness. And also it, it may come out that they feel weaker through their legs. A lot of the nerves that innervate the legs are around the lumbar area. If you are in a slightly more lordotic position, there could be, you know, room for the nerve to not be functioning as well. So they may feel like they're not as functional in their legs, like they may be getting I don't know, issues with their legs as well, uh, with the weakness mm. or just things not functioning as well. They might not be able to run, it might be uncomfortable. Um, so it does have a knock on effect up and down the body as well. Then maybe if they're not breathing well, they may start to get neck issues and shoulder issues because they're using the neck and shoulder muscles to breathe with. And these muscles we don't use mm. to breathe, they're accessory muscles. They, they're, they're used to obviously hold our head up. So they, they may not be because they can't get their breath because they're in this like really lordotic position that then the diaphragm can't move. So now that it's kind of coming up into here and the, so they may feel anxious as well and it may just they may just feel crappy and they'll everything like if they'll visit like a midwife or a doctor they'll put it all down to the fact that they've had a baby had a baby that's why you feel bad and it's like no you feel bad because your breathing is a little bit off and actually we need to make that breathing more functional and then when that Mm -hmm. feels better the anxiety and that feeling of feeling will go and you won't have all these neck issues and maybe leg issues and back issues and you will just feel more coordinated and stronger and potentially be able to think and feel better and sleep better as well so I think it has a real Mm. knock-on effect so if any mums are out there feeling jittery and, and anxious and just in pain and achy and they've got neck issues and anything going on, I would definitely have a look at the diastasis rectum to check that that's all, all, all in and, and working well. Yeah, cool. That's awesome. And then I think a word I throw in is disconnected. You feel disconnected. Yes. Yes, very much so. From, like from your legs. Weakness can manifest they feel very from your legs. Yeah. 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 They feel and, disconnected uh, because core, the, the nerves like, are pinching. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nose pinching. So it's just like, yeah, you just feel like, okay, I don't really notice this part of my body, you know, as much as I used yeah. to. It can feel like, yeah, um, yeah a connection is a connection is a good one. If you feel like it, it just doesn't feel like you have that awareness of a particular part of your body, mm. so it can manifest in weakness and manifest into like awareness as well, like in a connection. Absolutely. I don't feel connected. When you feel connected you feel like you know you can bounce you've got to bounce to your step you're you, know, you feel strong posture feels like you can hold yourself up without much effort but when yes. you don't feel so connected everything feels like it's an effort to do because yeah. it's right because that's your body's it. not being efficient yeah you just everything's an effort and that's that's when you'd probably look at things like diastasis recti if they've had a c-section you look at that c-scar as well things like that they often will say they feel disconnected when they've had a c-section as well um Again, that's another conversation, another time, I think, because that's that's quite a big deal. But yeah, and you can have the two going on as well. And that's when they just feel massively disconnected and really weak and they just they just feel really off and it, it makes them feel shitty. Mm. And and then when they get everything back, that functionality back and they're breathing really well and their core feels better, it's like a different person. It really is. And it's mm. lovely to see. So yeah. yeah, and then they can go off and do the stuff that they want to do. Like loads of mums come to me, they're like, I want to run. And it's like great. Mm. Let's let's get you to that point, you know. And mm. and when they when they're like, I ran today. It wasn't for long, but I ran and I felt good. Then you're like, yeah, that's that's a really nice thing to hear. And they felt strong. That's what you want people to get yeah. to. Just just feeling a bit like them again. Because when you have a baby, you uh, you don't feel like yourself for a really long time. As in, you know, you've got this new person, and it's all about them. And and you and you want to get back to how you were. I mean, you're never going to get back how you were but you just want to feel a bit of you again and I think coming and doing the rehab and feeling like you can run again and have that momentary time where it's a bit of you is is powerful for them so Mm. it's it's nice to see yeah amazing I think that'll be a good um, podcast episode to dedicate to um, new mums 
basically it's like what For sure. can you do? like within the first within the first year of being yeah. uh, being a parent like how can you how can you just yeah how can you manage that how can you take care of yourself yeah. while your priority is this new, new human being and this new child and yeah like, you know, this is absolutely. the love of your life now you know nothing else matters as much as yeah, this nothing as much else as this matters kid, so, no yeah that could be an interesting one it's um yeah i think that would be a really really lovely podcast to to do um because it does it changes everything so yeah, yeah you, so you can say if you can say it from experience and you can say it from um experience as a practitioner as well as like you know helping Absolutely. these people to actually yeah. get their health back get their moving back get their get out of pain and feel like they're yeah. rolling on forward and back to the back to the person that they know yeah they used to back absolutely to the person they used to. and you know my my story from postnatal you know i i I'm, and i won't i'll leave it for that podcast but my journey was pretty tough so i'm i'm right there with everyone that's had a really difficult time so you know it's 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 a it's a tough time it's beautiful but at the same time you know everyone's journey is different and it doesn't always work out the way you want it to work out and and your body you know i thought i was just gonna be you know i'm so fit i'm gonna be fine but no it was it, it mm. actually was more detrimental to having a baby to be that fit and and i wish i knew now what i knew i wish i knew then what i knew now um because mm. i think it would be a hell of a lot easier Okay, interesting. Yeah, we're gonna have to yeah. we're gonna have to chat about that one day. That's yeah, awesome. for sure. Let's say we'll wrap it. We'll wrap it up there. Cool. Great. Yeah, that was <laughs> awesome. And like, yeah, listen, ladies, go and see Jude if you're struggling with these kinds of issues. You've got lower back pain. If you've got uh, diastasis recti, you know you want to go and speak to Jude. How can they find you, Juju? Um, so you can find me through my website, which is www.jkpilates.com or I'm on Instagram just as Jude underscore Hersheimer. Uh, yeah, or you can type my name to Google, uh, Jude Hersheimer, I'll spell it H-I-R-S-C-H-E-I-M-E-R. -E -E <laughs> it's really long. Um, but yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, you can find me that way as well. Or yeah, my name will be on the podcast. So yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Uh, please share this episode with someone who's going to find it really useful. I'm sure there will be people who are going to find it useful, you know, talking about functional movement, what it is, you know, how to get it, what you need to be looking out for. Diocese directly, this is a big one because there's so many misconceptions around it, myths around it and how to actually deal with it. Share with people who need to hear about that. And um, thank you for tuning in. Leave us a rating um, on your Apple iTunes store or um, give us a thumbs up on uh, YouTube if you're enjoying the episode and yeah subscribe to the podcast as well and because we've got a lot more good episodes coming up for you so thank you very much and we will see you next time thank you